Hello, 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 and welcome back um, to another episode of the NX Show, uh, where we talk about NX and we talk about the ecosystem, and we even got a, a, a tree in the back because we're <laughs> it's that time of season. So, um, but yeah, thanks to those who are. So you already have some people in the chat here. Thanks for showing up. Um, but yeah, we talk about NX. We talk about the ecosystem. We talk about cool projects. Um, and today I have a special guest who's not uh, who's familiar in the in the Angular community and well known. Uh, but Manfred, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, with pleasure. So thanks for having me. I'm Manfred Steyer, and I'm a trainer for Angular, especially when it comes to Angular for enterprise scale applications. Mm -hmm. I'm helping a lot of companies with training workshops and with consultancy. And I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert team. Cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. I know you, we've uh, done a lot of stuff together in the past. Like I said, you being a, a GD, you've definitely done a lot of cool stuff for the uh, Angular community and built some things around that that a lot of us have taken advantage, taken advantage of, including NX. So. Uh, props go to you. Uh, yeah, for those in the chat, like I said, welcome. And if you have any questions while we're chatting here, feel free to drop those in there. But the, of course, the topic of uh, focus today is uh, module federation and micro front ends in Angular. Um, and some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Um, but Manfred, why don't you, what, if somebody, ask you like what is module federation do you have an elevator pitch let's start with the elevator pitch and then maybe we can get into kind of yeah good what idea. that kind of means yeah mm -hmm. so to put it in a nutshell module federation is about loading something from a differently compiled differently uh no separately compiled and separately deployed application that mm -hmm. means I can grab over there to another application and load a component from over there or a module or perhaps just a function. Mm -hmm. And this allows for plug-in systems, but it also allows for something like uh, micro frontends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, micro, micro frontends seem to be the, the, I don't want to call them the hot thing these days because I think we've been kind of going after these uh, going after the micro front ends for a while and meant like many different ways, whether it's uh, bundling a different uh, separate apps together and then kind of using those on separate pages. But my uh, module federation kind of takes that to the next level where you can still kind of have a cohesive experience. Um, can you talk about like comparing like module federation to like a traditional, a traditional angular app, I, I would say? Yeah. So I think the main difference is you really cut your application into pieces. Mm -hmm. Normally you cut the application so that you have several business domains as individual applications. And those applications are called the micro frontends. Mm -hmm. They can be developed in isolation by an autarkic team. So the idea is to bring back the agility, even though you have a huge project you split up your people into several autarkic teams and they work on their business domains or to say the least on their micro frontends. Mm -hmm. And when they are done, then they are just deploying it. That means they don't need to coordinate with each other that much. They just deploy it when they are done. And so they can provide additional business value on a regular basis. This is the main idea, scaling teams so mm -hmm. that you have autarkic teams that can work without interacting too much with other teams. Yeah, and I, I definitely see how that's, uh, of course, with the clients that you work with and ones we work with is how that can help them in, in these, like you said, larger enterprise environments where you have any number of teams or uh, groups kind of working on a single project, but they still want to have some some level of uh, independence, I would say, as far as what they can build and um, how they can ship pieces of the pieces of the application together and kind of the micro front ends uh, lets you break that up. Um, and I guess the, like I guess for me, just uh, painting a picture in it in my mind, it was like how we used or how we the other I was call it the traditional way of building 
Angular apps is we usually think of like the 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 lazy loading being the only boundaries that you could have because you still have to stitch the app together. It's still like one app at the end of the day, one build. Um, but the, like you said, the micro front ends kind of take, you can have lazy loaded apps per se, as opposed to just lazy loaded chunks that are part of, still part of one, like one large application. Hmm. Yeah, totally. And I think the main difference is with traditional lazy loading, we need to compile everything together. If you mm -hmm. look at how applications are built nowadays, everything is compiled together. That means everything needs to be known at compile time. Mm -hmm. And the reason is our bundlers like Webpack and the Angular CLI that is using Webpack try to squeeze out the last bytes of our bundles. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hence, they compile everything together, they optimize everything together, think on tree shaking, and then and only then they cut everything into chunks for lazy loading. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about micro frontends, this is too late. We don't want to know the other stuff from other teams up front. We just want to load the newest stuff from them using a given URL at runtime. So it's all about runtime integration, to put it in another way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. And I guess to me, like you said, it helps teams uh, develop in, like independently. But how do you see, are there other ways that you've seen micro front ends uh, kind of help teams and uh, teams work, uh, in, I don't want to say work independent of each other, but at the end of the day, if they can ship, you know, what they're building as a completely separate unit, uh, mm. what other things have you, has it, allow them to do besides just splitting up the app itself? Yeah, I think a good start would be to create some modules. Perhaps mm -hmm. if you use NX modules in terms of libraries, there are those great best practices in NX where you split an application into scopes. I call it business domains mm -hmm. and into layers. This is, of course, a good start. And then you can use access restrictions in an X so that not everything is intermingled with everything else. But if you really want to have several applications that can be deployed separately, then you need to do something I would call runtime integration. Then you need mm -hmm. to put all those pieces at runtime, stake them, and put them together into a greater whole let's call it a shell or something like this. And for this, there are several approaches. Uh, the easiest approach for sure is just going with hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. This works perfectly if the user sticks with a given domain, with a given micro front end for some minutes or some hours. Mm -hmm. Let's think on Office 365. Then I'm writing an article I'm sticking with Word for the next six hours. Then I'm doing the budget for the next year. I'm spending the next quarter in Excel. So this shows that people don't move around that much. However, if you need to move around a lot between your business domains, then loading another single page applications by pointing to them via a hyperlink is an overkill. Mm -hmm. Because this means you are losing all the benefits of single page applications. And in those cases, people in the past used something like iframes. I know it's not the most <laughs> famous approach. Iframes are, as I take it, not the most famous HTML element, but it worked. And back then, we mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of other alternatives. Yeah, I then saw... We... I saw uh... Uh, it was, I, mean, I saw a, a Twitter where they did a poll. Uh, there was a person on Twitter did a poll of what the favorite uh, HTML elements were, and I think iframe <laughs> lost out pretty <laughs> lost out pretty quickly amongst the <laughs> amongst the choices. So yeah, I think so. Yeah, iframe and marquee or blink tag something <laughs> like that. Hey, marquee was the was the was you was doing big things if you were doing marquee back in the day, but. Uh, they they quickly <laughs> marquee quickly got shoveled into the corner and uh, for until so people told him not to use it anymore. So it kind of fell. It's still there, of course, but kind of fell by the wayside. I think. Mm, yeah. 
Sometimes I use it just for fun in my trainings, just to shock <laughs> people, to wake them up so that they can follow the rest of the workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good I think that's a good idea. Uh, ring gonna start the the bring marquee back uh, yeah. campaign. <laughs> see if it, see is if he it serious? No, no, he is not no. serious. <laughs> no, I'm not serious. Please don't, unless you have some, you know, something building that you're just kind of messing around with. You can use marquee there, but please, no more shipping of uh, marquee tags in your in your apps, uh, unless you're totally like, updating an totally. uh, old site from like. 1995 or something like that that you <laughs> that you can't update uh, yeah it's it's that much 1995 <laughs> you have to stick it in the way back machine yeah uh, but yeah like you said uh you can link kind of link these two applications together uh separate applications together with hyperlinks and that could be one way and then but you mentioned the drawbacks with that as far as um those are two separate apps and you're like reloading the entire page and you kind of lose the, all the goodness of uh, single page apps, even if you're like under a different, a same suite of applications and module federation kind of takes that and gives you some of that, uh, those benefits back uh, as being able to still have the single page app. Um, but what, what are kind of some of the, you, you talked about like different domains and, um, how you can split up the app uh, using that, but um, we, I'm sure that there, some people will say, "Well, that's great," but now, now everybody can deploy independently uh, if they, you know, if they so choose. So, can you talk about like, what some, what are some of the, the like drawbacks of using micro front ends or using, yeah. mod, using module federation specifically for for that? Yeah, I think that's an important topic because. You have always consequences if you choose for this or that architectural style. And you also have those consequences with module federation. And not all consequences are advantages. Some of them are also disadvantages. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest issue or the greatest challenge when going with module federation is that you have runtime integration. Of mm -hmm. course, this is what we want to have. But it also means that we are turning compile time dependencies into runtime dependencies. That means you cannot guarantee that everything works seamlessly together until you've tried it out. Right. And this means you need to have a sound set of integration tests. Of okay. course, integration tests are always important, but especially needed if you go with runtime integration. Right, because you, you're happen. also introducing some some complexity there, like you said, because you can't, you're not necessarily type checking everything or building everything at the same time. You kind of cut a hard line in between those boundaries. Totally. Or think on version mismatches. Mm -hmm. This micro front end is using version eight from a library, and this here is using version nine of the same library and then you load both of them into the browser and all hell might break <laughs> loose so yeah it's it's really an issue you have yeah, to take we'll, care of this yeah we'll definitely uh talk about different versions of angular and it may be even if i haven't i don't i'm not sure if there's been a big push on uh, module federation and other frameworks but we can get into that uh also um in that but yeah like you said there are like I said, the drawbacks there of being able to, or having that separation there and the, having needing the integration test in there. Um, but, but as far as like the integration test goes, would you, uh, consider those, you still have those as, I guess, are they kind of like end to end tests for integration where you're, you're still like standing up all the apps together, or are you still using a more traditional approach where you're, kind of testing the pieces together, even though they're split up at runtime, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it would be rather an end-to-end -end test, I guess. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can mock the backend, then it's not a fully end-to-end -end test, but it's all about trying out if everything works seamlessly, if you load several separately compiled pieces into your application shell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... That yeah, that brings up, 
I, at least I have another get another thought about that one as far as the um like development time debugging and things like that is there is there a bigger I guess hurdle in uh development as far as when, let's say something something between the two micro front ends is in talking correctly to each other uh, is there any extra steps required in like for developers that have to like when you're debugging the like that layer between two different apps that are in a micro or two different apps between like the host and um the shell or the host and the i don't know what you call the the child mm. apps uh the yeah. communication between those of course yeah it's it's a bit more difficult because you talk to someone you don't know and mm. you don't even know if someone is listening <laughs> uh, I think the, <laughs> I think the best what you can do is messaging. I really mm -hmm. try to share just a simple service with some behavior subjects, and I'm just putting some data in those behavior subjects. And if someone is listening, perhaps it's one micro front end, perhaps it's five micro front ends, then they get the information. And if no one is listening, then it's also fine for me. I've just mm -hmm. provided this piece of information. I see. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's more a matter of, like you said, if the, the, the one who's providing the information is the, is the one that, um, they can't necessarily know that the other, the downstream apps are getting that, but it's, it's, that's one good way to tell is as far as like health, maybe health checks are concerned and those kind of things between the, the shell and the, the downstream apps. Is there a, is there a specific term for the 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 non-host apps or what do you uh, just call them micro front ends you just call them micro front ends okay. yeah the official term is remote in um module federation okay. because module federation is a general purpose thing it's not just tailored for micro front ends so they just talk about remotes but if we use this for micro front end architectures then those remotes are the micro front ends Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the. I think that's the term I. I could, the name escaped me, but remotes is the, the term I was looking for, uh, there. Um, yeah. So you, we talked about kind of the, the different libraries and the, like I said, the different domains that you can have uh, using micro front ends, and of course with in NX workspaces we recommend that you break things down into libraries because you're going to have a lot of those, and even you recommend using a domain driven uh, design approach to architecting, you know, large applications in that way. Uh, so how do you share libraries between different uh, host and remote apps uh, mm. in module federation? And uh, is there any difference in what you maybe are there any differences in what you have to do there? Yeah. That's actually one of the cool features of uh, module federation, mm -hmm. because with module federation, you can configure what to share and in which way to share it. Uh, you can say, hey, let's only load Angular once. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, let's load Angular once per major version. So if we have two different micro front ends mm -hmm. needing two different major versions of <laughs> Angular, then you could tell it, hey, each micro front end gets its own version of Angular. Mm -hmm. And this is fun at first sight, but it brings further challenges because that means you need to bootstrap several versions of Angular side by side, mm -hmm. which is completely doable. You can do it, but you need some workarounds. You need some motivation. You really need to be enthusiastic to make this work. But if you really need it, then you can make it work. If you don't need it, then I would not even try it because it's complicating things and the Angular team is not really recommending it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, yeah, like I said, I don't know of a good, I can't think, at least I can't think of a good use case where you would um, want to try to stitch multiple versions of Angular together on the same page. Because like I said, if you're, kind of building all within the same space, you think you'd be on a single version or at least trying to get uh, every every app on a single version just to uh, decrease the, like the complexity of that. Because like I said, there could be uh, 
even if you have different host versus remote apps, just there, like though, I think it's always the subtle things that kind of bite you uh, when you're trying to mix two versions of Angular together. I mean, even I was just thinking of even previous times where we were talking about just single apps and uh, just kind of migrating from one version to the next. Uh, mm. Even those little subtle changes will uh, kind of creep up and bugs are introduced there. So trying to introduce that or have that along with uh, loading that at the runtime aspect of that seems like it just seems a good place for errors to unknown errors to pop up that you wouldn't normally have, right? Yeah, totally. Sometimes my customers have requirements like this because they say, hey, we have so many different teams and they don't even know each other. They work mm -hmm. in different locations. They are experts for different domains. If you think on banking, there might be an expert for account management and another expert for managing stocks. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, when it comes to our consumer client, we want to have everything nicely arranged there in terms of tiles and so on, so that we can see our portfolio and our uh, current transactions. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, sometimes customers say, we really want that those teams can work in an autarkic way. And yeah, it's possible, but you need a lot of trade-offs and there are several sources of uh, errors, as you have said. Yeah, so in environments like that, do you do you see that there's like a central team that kind of manages the the host uh, application that, and then yeah. the downstream teams kind of manage their own uh, subsets, even for the ones that have gone down the path of having like multiple versions of Angular, you, do you still stitch all those together down in the remote apps in it and the kind of the people who maintain the host app kind of coordinate that or is it a little different? Yeah, I think you need at least one or two people that are mainly responsible for the integration. Mm -hmm. Those are the people talking to all the teams, establishing some conventions so that everything can uh, puts together in a nice way. Yeah, you need at least one or two people taking care of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense because you don't, like I said, you still want to have some independence as far as your applications goes, but there still needs to be somebody who knows how all the pieces fit together, and, at least for, I would say, troubleshooting or at least upgrades, if anything, on that yeah. case, uh, even if you're trying to move from like I said, multiple versions to be down to a single version at some point, maybe it's just a stop gap, uh, why you have the multiple versions because, you know, people don't have the bandwidth to upgrade their individual versions and things like that. So mm. that makes sense. Um, but if it is somehow possible, I would really recommend to stick with one angular version. It mm. makes everything more seamlessly. Uh, for instance, if you just have one angular version, then loading something from over there from a separately compiled and deployed application just looks like lazy loading from Angular's perspective. Mm -hmm. That means Angular does not even recognize that we are loading a micro frontend. Underneath the covers, Webpack is doing the heavy lifting, but Angular is not recognizing. And that means you can use Angular as it was intended to be used. You don't mm -hmm. need to tweak it. You don't need any workarounds. And so you get a real straightforward and beautiful solution. <laughs> I think that's the goal. That's the <laughs> that's definitely the goal that you want, uh, especially with working in large projects. Is you want to simplify those simplify those complex things that you can control, and uh, you know take on the other the other parts of that. So, um, and maybe you answered this already, but uh, let's say you have the multiple versions multiple versions uh, of Angular in module as you're using with module federation is there a prescribed approach outside of like don't do this of how you handle how you handle the different versions do you like you said do you just keep them kind of keeping them as, as isolated as possible or how do you how do you manage those version mismatches yeah so the good message is that module federation helps you with this mm -hmm. you can tell module federation to only load one version of your libraries or you could tell it to load several versions of it 
if uh, several micro frontends need different versions of this or that NBM package. Mm -hmm. But as also mentioned before, when it comes to having several versions of Angular, you need to bootstrap Angular several times. Oh, and yeah. so you need a lot of workarounds. One workaround is you need to share zone.js. Mm -hmm. You know, zone.js is still a thing. Hopefully it will go away in the future, but currently it's still a thing. Uh, another thing is if you, for instance, want to share uh, one Angular version, and mm -hmm. even though you share it, you bootstrap several Angular uh, applications, you need to share your platform because the platform can only be instantiated once. Right. It means you also need a track. Or if you have several micro frontends, then you can have also several routers. And normally a router <laughs> thinks that uh, the URL over there in the URL bar belongs fully to him. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this is not true. In this case, the router has to share the URL with other routers in other single page applications. Mm -hmm. And so you also need to tweak the router a bit. Okay. And uh, the, the setup is now, is there any, like you said, you got multiple routers. Is there any additional things you have to specifically do for each application so that the, the routers don't? try to conflict with each other or is that kind of handled by the by the well, integration itself we have we have two approaches the first approach is working with url matches instead mm -hmm. instead of bobs we are using url matches and they tell the router okay router now it's your time now it's show time for you please mm -hmm. take this route or now you are not uh uh, supposed to do anything because it's not your route, it's the route of the other micro front end. This is one approach going with URL matches. Okay, I see. So it's pretty, it's still, uh, as far as the approach goes, it's still in line with what you would do if you were just kind of lazy loading, but you were using the, instead of using a straight path match, you use the, the route matcher to have a little more flexibility for flexibility there, if I understand right. Yeah. And then other, the other approach is uh, to tweak the, how do you call it, the history API of mm -hmm. the browser. So that each and every router thinks that he has the ownership over the URL mm -hmm. because the batched version gives each and every router its very own URL. But at the end of the day, it is also combining those URLs like Angular is doing with Aux roots and putting it into your address bar. This is another mm -hmm. approach we are currently experimenting with. Oh man, I didn't even, <laughs> <is> the, <laughs> just throwing the router and even the, the auxiliary routes in there it seems like a whole nother level of uh, integration that you have to be aware of if you're if you're using uh, auxiliary routes um, very very, yeah. very powerful though but like i said a lot of a lot of uh, things that you kind of have to manage or be aware of i would say uh, yeah totally it that. falls down the road so as mentioned before if you don't need it don't use it but if you really really need it and if you even need it after thinking twice about it, then there are, <laughs> there are solutions. There are solutions you can go with. Yeah, there was a, uh, I don't know, I can't remember if it was a movie or not I saw, but there was a, they were, they were consulting their handbook uh, that they used to, it was, I think it was a cartoon or something, but they were kind of taking over, trying to take over the planet and they were consulting their handbook and the handbook says, okay, did you check on page 67? And it was like, okay, no, I haven't checked that. It's like, well, okay, I'll check page 67. Page 67 says, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> it says, uh, yes. If you do, okay, go to page 77. Now, are you really sure? <laughs> you want to do that? And it kind of went on like that. Uh, and it kind of seems that that's the same way here about just be sure that you really want to uh, take on that, that uh, part of the app or introduce that, um, functionality, you know, based on what you're trying to do. So, yeah, totally. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about consequences and mm -hmm. you have some architectural goals and then you need to find an implementation that fulfills those architectural goals. 
and hopefully has more advantages than disadvantages. Yeah, definitely true. Uh, let's see. I'm going to jump in the chat here and see. I know we have a few questions here. And uh, of course, if you're hanging out in chat, feel free to chime in, throw some questions in there, and we'll try to answer those uh, if we can. Mostly Manfred will you know, try to answer them. I'll try to <laughs> throw in some context too. But uh, we'll take a look at this first one. Uh, it says, can you explain how micro front ends and Angular affect bundle size and shared code between them? And also what about shared state using uh, NGRX? Hmm. It depends a bit upon how you implement micro front ends. But if you go with module federation, you can tell it by using the configuration to share Angular, for instance, or to share mm -hmm. NGRX. So first of all, this is a benefit. However, there is a little tiny drawback, namely things you are sharing, packages you are sharing, cannot be tree shaking because you don't know upfront which parts of this package are used by this or that lazily loaded micro front. Oh, right. So you can have, even though it's kind of stitching everything together, each particular app is going to have its own copy of NGRX or whatever the other uh, libraries that you're kind of sharing across the host and remote? Yeah, you can do both. You can say, well, every one of you gets an own copy, an own version of NGRX, mm -hmm. uh, an own instance, or you could say, well, just let's load it once and let's share it. And in this case, you have one huge state tree that is reused by all those micro front ends. However, as micro front ends are about decoupling things, Mm -hmm. which is the basis for our dark teams, it is recommended that one micro front end does not know about the branches used by other micro front ends. Mm -hmm. The lesser they know, the better it is because it's all about decoupling. Right. Yeah, I think that there's another question. I think that kind of leads into, is a, is a good uh, lead into, like you talked about that with routing of, how does the how do you need to know or do you even need to know about all the possible routes uh, before the each particular micro front end loads? Yeah. So if you go with module federation and if you restrict yourself to just one version of Angular, then this is a piece of cake. Because in this case, everything looks like lazy loading for Angular. Mm -hmm. Underneath the cover. Uh, Webpack is doing a lot of stuff, but for Angular, it just looks like lazy loading. Angular does not even know that we are lazily loading this chunk from a different application. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you are mixing and matching different versions of Angular, you need to bootstrap several Angular applications, and then you need all those dirty tricks and workarounds to orchestrate the different routers you have in this and that Angular SPA. I see. Yeah, I think we got one more here, but I don't. I don't know. If this was is micro front end specific, but it says, "Can you share Angular IV or other dependencies if you use module federation and have multiple Angular front ends?" But I think that I think at least for from my understanding that uh, you're still at the end of the day you're still using whatever version of Angular, and if you're on version eleven or later, I think where IV is the default. Um, then you would naturally be using IV already. So I think it's more, at that point, you're still just developing a regular Angular app. Do you think that's correct or do you have anything to add there? Yeah, totally, totally. So, and it's also just a matter of configuration. If you mm -hmm. tell it by using the config, share Angular core, share Angular common, and the other stuff, then it will be shared at runtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings up a, a good question. So if you don't configure uh, Angular Core, kind of just thinking out in the weeds here, but if you don't configure Angular Core as far as being shared at the top, are there are you going to run into any issues as far as them, you having multiple copies of the, the particular apps or are they still just going to run independently of each other? So is this about bootstrapping several single page applications that might share the same version of Angular? Yeah, yeah I'm just thinking if you have, let's say you, yeah, you want to bootstrap multiple versions or multiple uh, 
micro front ends on the page, but you're not necessarily sharing their dependencies. Uh, I guess you recommend, you still recommend kind of sharing those things up front, right? Or is it, uh, do you, is there a trade off to, to doing that even if you're all under the same version? If you need the same version, normally sharing is fine. Of course, when sharing stuff, then you lose tree shaking because mm -hmm. you cannot predict what you will actually need. Uh, this is the only drawback. However, if we talk about a bigger application, then chances are high that you need most of the stuff in there. So then perhaps it's not that a big drawback. Mm -hmm. And saying this, when I'm saying you lose tree shaking for libraries, then I need to be a more precise. At the end of the day, I need to say you lose tree shaking for entry points because you share each and every entry point. Mm -hmm. If you don't need Angular common testing, then it will not be included because oh, right. module federation works on an entry point level. I see. And let's see, let's just check in and see if we got any other questions prior to the stream here. Uh, let's see, share components. Um, yeah, so there was one um, question is, and this is kind of outside, all right, there was one question and another question in the chat here, but you, I'm sure you have a link to this as there. If there's a repo on GitHub for the sample uh, configuration yeah. that you have, totally. I know we wrote a guide on this also, and we can you can feel uh, we will have that in the show notes uh, for a sample application oh. that you have. If, if you have a link to that, you can share that too, and we'll put that in the in the notes there. And we also, like I said, have a guide on that uh, for using mm -hmm. that within uh, NX. So, oh yeah, great, great. Uh, yes, yeah, so there was uh, a question here, and I'll try to bring it up here. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a long one, so feel free to punt if you choose to do so. <laughs> uh, let's see. If I could bring this up here. Uh, so the question was, how can I share components inside another component? Currently, we need to use load remote module and component ref for including components inside another component. Mm. And, and the rest of it um, says, and they use those actions, uh, need those actions to, I guess, how can they use those uh, components? I guess if you have an answer for that one, how can they use those? Is there, is there a simpler way to do that, I would say? Because it, it cut off some of the... Actually the not. There. And the reason is that this, what is described here, is more or less how currently lazy loading of components in Angular works. Mm -hmm. Normally, you need to point with a dynamic import to the component over there, and then you need to put it into a few container. Yes, that's right. Yep. And, and it, it's the same with module federation. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be dynamic, instead of the dynamic import, you use this helper function, load remote module, which is kind of a dynamic import that mm -hmm. is uh, just taking a string configuration, telling the system where to find this micro front end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. Um, yeah, and I did have, I think we're, at a good point here, but I did have one, maybe one or two more questions about like, where do you see for kind of foresee micro front ends and module federation kind of evolving? I think we're, we're, I guess we're at the point, at least in Angular, that uh, it's not, it's no longer a proof of concept. Uh, and it's something that people are actually like shipping in production. So do you see uh, improvements that could be made there as far as module federation or even maybe uh, support for that outside of Webpack, I think would be maybe a long shot. Do you foresee any of that uh, happening in the future? Yeah, people are already starting with this. There are several ports to other, to other platforms. I think mm -hmm. there is a partial port to white. And uh, don't shoot me, I think... 
it has been also migrated to ES build, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not totally sure. But what I know is people are starting to migrate it to other platforms because they like the idea. Mm -hmm. And funnily, if we would still use system.js, uh, we wouldn't <laughs> even need oh. it. <laughs> because system.js is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, is capable of loading something from over there at runtime. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of the current bundlers, really try to compile everything together in terms of reducing the bundle size, you need a solution like module federation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying you you went back to another another relic of uh, previous days before the the Angular CLI when we were loading everything ourselves with uh, System JS and uh, kind of letting it do everything on the fly, uh, which is I don't want to say it's kind of like what uh, Vit does, but it kind of has that similar feel to it where you just kind of tell it where the files are and uh, it kind of loads everything uh, as as you need it you know say at runtime so. Uh, definitely has kind of similar feel there. Maybe we're just trying to get to uh, get back to that, um, get back to that way where we can kind of move a little more freely as far as bundlers and and things are concerned. So, hmm. the thing is, currently it's painful because there is no CLI support, and without CLI mm -hmm. support, it's not that much fun. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta. We had to integrate in order for you know people to get on board definitely has to have that that set of integration there and of course like we uh have all the you provided the the integration for making it uh straightforward to set up and then nx kind of has the generators and things to help you get uh started quicker and managing the applications and things so mm -hmm. uh, yeah i think the integration i think the at least the integration will probably get better as far as just making it easier to manage and uh uh, work with them that way because I think I think there's we're still going to get more and more uh, as far as like these like you said these larger applications banks and like I said office type uh, I guess office 365 type suites where you have multiple things but still considered under one umbrella and still want to have that experience where we'll we'll still have more um, still have more usage and more use cases coming out of out of this so definitely excited to see what how that continues to grow. Mm, totally, yeah. Yeah, so I uh, think on that, uh, I didn't see any more questions. We have one more question here is about, does it work fine inside uh, Docker? But I don't see any reason why uh, that would be the case as long as you have your, you know, your like independent pieces set up correctly. Yeah, totally, totally. Module Federation does not care where the pieces are coming from. Mm -hmm. If it has a pointer to them, if it knows their URL, then everything is fine. Yeah, cool. Okay, so yeah, I think we'll I think we'll call it there. Where can you you're around on the internet? Where can people find you? And uh, if they want to, you know, learn for more about past what we talked about here today, where can people find you on the on the on the internet? Well, uh, I use Twitter a lot. So mm -hmm. if you want to find me on Twitter, it's just my name, Manfred Steyer in camel case. Mm -hmm. Or uh, if you want to look out my blog, uh, it's called Angular Architects IO. Angular Architects IO. Just one word. Yep. No we'll dash or underline. Share, that, share a link to the uh, website in the chat there. I'll also include that. Uh, in the show notes uh, so people can check that out and like I said we'll include all the the things that we talked about here there links and things like that and so if you're watching on YouTube go ahead and hit the hit the like button on the video if you if you stuck with it this this long you might as well <laughs> hit the like button so other people will see it and uh, definitely subscribe to the channel if you haven't already um, yeah like I said Manfred thank you for coming on again to talk about uh, Angular and Module Federation, and like I said, we're we the you. overall theme is uh, modern Angular, so we want to stay on track with that. And I think Module Federation does does play into that uh, picture. So, thank you for coming on, and I think with that, uh, we'll see you next time. See ya.